That was beautiful. Early. Good morning. Good morning. It's a good day. Is Jane Deal here? Well, if you see her, wish her a happy birthday. You turned 90, is that correct? That's wonderful. Okay, we have a number of announcements, and we have two people that are going to be sharing. So I want to call Rita up right now. You, yeah, probably from there. Good morning. How is everybody? Um, you should know by now that if you see me, I need something. Um, and what I was here to talk to you for just a few minutes is about trunk or treat this year. Um, I know it's a lot different than what we're used to doing. It's not the big extravaganza that we're used to, unfortunately. Um, but we are doing a drive through only trunk or treat. Um, and the only thing that we are doing are the trunks. We're not doing the food or the games or anything like that this year. But as of today, I only have six trunks signed up to come that day. Um, and it is the 31st. Halloween happens to fall on Saturday this year. And it's from six to seven. So if you've been thinking about signing up and you have not or... You need me to, if you have some questions or anything like that, just feel free to get with me today. I really need to know today um, how many trunks I'm going to have. Um, this typically is really big for our community. Um, I know a lot of people are wanting things to get back to normal, but for right now, this is as normal as our trunk or treat can get, but I still, I still need the help. Um, um, I have a lot of things set up to try to make a drive through trunk or treat fun, but without the trunks, it's just not going to be possible. So if you can let me know by today, if you're watching and you're not here, um, you can send a message, put a message on the Facebook page and Daniel will get that to me. Um, there are sign up sheets still here and in the back if you haven't filled one out yet. Um, they're in the bulletin too. Um, so feel free to take that out right now and fill it out. Um, yes, sir. If you're thinking and praying about this, which you need to do both, Meet her right here in front of that immediately after service. The way you get things done is you do it. If you're thinking about it, do it. Can you meet them there? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Thank you. I believe in getting things done. Yes, it's a big evangelism event for our church. It's not really a fundraiser in any way. It's more of a community event. Um, it always has been here, um, and we're going to put out, you know, church information for the cars that come by. Um, we have people that visit our church from Trunk or Treat, um, and we hope they continue to feel comfortable enough and join us. Um, so it's not just an event for our church. It's not just an event for our children. Um, it's a community event, and it's an important event here. Even though it is Halloween-themed, it's not scary Halloween-themed, and it's typically fun. So um, it's just a big event for everybody here, but I just need the help and the support to get it done. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask Tini McCullough, who's right here, who is, has been married to Wayne for 49 years as of yesterday. Here, give her a hand. <laughs> Bless her heart. <laughs> thank you for that. This shoebox represents something uh, that we're going to do this year. It's called Samaritan's Purse. And uh, Andrew asked that I say a word or two today and show an example of what you can put in here if you want to do it. Um, our youth used to do that. But, of course, as Rita just said, things aren't normal this year. And we thought we would do a church-wide thing instead of just a youth group thing because they can't meet. So anybody in the congregation that would like to is invited to Get a shoe box. It can be a shoe box that you purchase shoes in or something like this. Yes, sir. Andrew's buying a hundred plastic shoe boxes. Oh, is he? I didn't so know that. So Andrew's gonna have the, the shoe box. All they have to do is bring the contents. I didn't know he had those. There you go. We're working together as a team. Okay. Um, I was not a privy to that information. That's okay. Anyway, when you get a shoe box. There's a list of things that you can put in it, and I've got a few examples here. There's also a list of some things that you cannot put in it, like candy, liquids, toy guns, 
Uh, these are going to countries that could have some uh, really interesting lifestyles there. So if this is something that you're thinking about doing and you're not sure what to put in it, I'm going to put this up front. You're welcome to look at it. Okay, while she's going back, i got a couple more announcements. Pull out your brochure for me, please. Just, just make it happen. Pull it out. On the red panel, you see it? Look at the red panel. Down at the bottom corner is that list of do not include. I have been on the packing end for Samaritan's Purse twice, and you would not. Oh, you don't have this. Well, let me see it. So I assume that's what you had. Does it not say distribution packing? No, it doesn't. Well, all right. These are in the office. Okay. Okay, I'm going to read it to you. Candy, toothpaste, gum, used or damaged items, war-related items, none of this can be given. Seeds, food, liquids or lotions, medications or vitamins, breakable items or glass containers or aerosol cans. Because the, the, you're, you're going to make these wonderful boxes and you're going to give Christmas to these children across the world. Will you ever see them? No. Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, what is going to happen, though, when it gets to the receiving section, uh, then a pamphlet from Samaritan's Purse is going to go with your box, and the gospel is going to be shared with the child in their language. So it's just a huge, wonderful deal. Um, my little church, Mount Hermon, is a little tiny congregation. I served for, the, for seven years. I mean, they did 130 one year. And it, it, it was crazy. It was wonderful. This is an opportunity to put flesh and blood uh, on the love of Jesus. And it's just a wonderful opportunity. Okay. You all received your membership update in the mail. Did you receive them? Three-page document from the church. How many received it? Raise your hands. I want to know. Okay. If you didn't, or recheck your mail, because they all went out. I know that, and there were 300 that went out. So just return them as soon as possible. Uh, next week in the bulletin, I've talked about, mentioned these constitutional changes in the NLC Constitution. Uh, unlike the ELCA, they, these decisions were made top down. Our decisions in the NLC are being made with congregational input. So I will have those changes in the bulletin, and then on November 15th, I think it is, when you have your annual meeting, that's when you'll either approve or disapprove, but you'll have plenty and plenty of time to know exactly what you're doing. If I have my messages right, does council meet briefly at 9 a.m. next Sunday? Okay. We'll talk more about it. I had it on my calendar. It could be wrong. Um, and Pastor Heidi Punt, the pastor at Union Lutheran, is being installed next Sunday at Union at 3. So we're very excited about that. Are there any other announcements? Okay. Again, please meet Rita here after services, and we can have that trunk and treat full. Okay? God bless you. Would you now please rise that we can make confession to God as we prepare for holy worship. Let our service begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Take a moment of silence to bring any personal sin before the Lord.
Father, thank you for hearing our personal confession. Let us now confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us when we were dead in sin and made us alive together in Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. May God strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Now let us pray. O oh God, our refuge and strength, since you yourself are the author of our devotion, graciously consider the devout prayers of your church. May those things which we ask in faith effectively follow by your grace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading is from the 45th chapter of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him, and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places, that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Here ends the reading. Let's read responsibly from Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the whole earth. Declare his glory among the nations and his wonders among all peoples. As for all the gods of the nations, they are but idols, but it is the Lord who made the heavens. Ascribe to the Lord, you families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord honor and power. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the earth tremble before him. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea thunder and all that is in it. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Amen. 
He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. The second reading is from the first chapter of 1 Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us, of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Acacia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Acacia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything, for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Here ends the reading. Stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. The Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his words. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us, then, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. This morning, I'd like to focus on this gospel reading, because there's a lot going on here, even though it's just a few verses. There's a lot of context surrounding, which, you know, I've brought into some sermons before. You know that if you've been to Bible study or watched any of the Bible studies online, I really like to bring in the context so we can really see what's going on on a level that's a little more accurate maybe than if we didn't do that, because we are separated by so much time and cultural differences from the first readers or from the people who experienced this with Jesus that I would like to do that and try to bring this out, to try to, to see exactly what these people are going through, and the first readers and first hearers are just assuming that we might miss. I think it's interesting because as we read over this, and it's kind of a, a more famous um, part of Matthew that we hear a lot about, when Jesus says something that seems kind of interesting, it's maybe a good point, when he responds with this good point, they marveled. Why would they marvel and then go away silent, defeated? It's an interesting thing. We really need to try to understand as best we can some of the things that might be going on so that we can marvel too. And so I think we'll start with the fact that the, the Pharisees are wanting to get rid of Jesus. They're wanting to get him in trouble. 
And at this time, we've talked about the intertestamental period a little bit and how the Sadducees and the Pharisees and all of the religious leaders in Jesus' day had really gone through and had a lot of Jewish history and things that happened to them that got them to a point of their focus being not what it should have been. In fact, they're, they were the called people of God, the selected people of God, and I've mentioned that they were a so that people before. They were called by God so that through them, the whole world can be brought back into the relationship with God. But what they started to do is they started to see that they were chosen by God and they were starting to act like the other nations, but those other nations were doing it better than they were. And all the criteria of a successful nation as far as worldly standard, they were not really matching up with the other nations. Their focus had shifted from God and his law as a relational thing to this law is the thing that we worship to separate us from the rest of the world. And we look forward to the day when we have our king, our Messiah, back so that we can have an army that can defeat all the other armies. And we're selected by God, not so that it will benefit the whole world, but we're selected by God. And how dare the rest of the world abuse his chosen people? And so when Jesus comes and starts saying these things and his teachings, it's offensive to them. Essentially, they're looking for and acting and doing all the things that are the opposite of what they should be doing. So when Jesus comes and corrects those things, the people he butts heads with most are the religious leaders. They like the status quo. And he comes to upend those things. So with that background of the Pharisees, they're trying to entrap him. And notice how they try to bring him in publicly to a place where they put him on the spot. They say, you teach truthful things. You teach God's word and God's law and, and who God is. You do that in a truthful way. And so now all the other people who are listening hear that and they think, okay, well, what's this man have to say to this question? And the question that they give him is a, a no-win situation. They say, is it okay to pay taxes to Caesar? As far as the Jews who are there at the time, the ones who are following the Pharisees, they see the Roman occupation as a great affront to God's sovereignty. They think that paying taxes to Rome is treason. They're supposed to be God's people with no king but God, no king but the, this Messiah who's going to come on behalf of God to free them from foreign oppression. And so to give in and to pay taxes to Caesar is treason. So if Jesus says that, he alienates all of the Jews. Also, there are some Herodians around, and there are some other folks there who are going to hear if he says, no, it's no, don't pay your taxes. Now, the power of Rome would come down on Jesus. Rome will let you have your religion. Rome will let you have your way of life. They won't make you do everything the way the Romans do, but you do have to pay your taxes. You do have to submit to their authority. If not, they'll devastate you. And so they're trying to put him in a situation here by taking these pillars of, of law and these pillars of the right thing to do and, and by taking two of them and matching them up to where Jesus has no right answer. But what does Jesus do? He reframes the understanding. He takes this thing that seems like it's a yes or a no answer, and he reframes it in a way that both makes the Pharisees leave, makes all of those trying to entrap him leave, and says something to those who are listening for the truth that even the Pharisees recognize was found in Jesus. And that says something to us, too. He asks for one of the coins that is used to pay the tax. And when they bring him a denarius, he looks at it 
and says whose image, whose picture, and inscription is on it. Now, you can look these up. You can find these. It's the classic coin of the Caesar's face and then an inscription around. And this inscription on this coin, which we found some of, mentions the divine nature of that Caesar. We're at the point now in Rome's history where they've had such great Caesars that they're starting to think of them as gods. So this image and this inscription mentions that this is Caesar, God, divine Caesar. Can you see why it would be something where the Jews would say, this is not okay for us to be paying these things to the Caesar who thinks he's God. But Jesus reframes it a little bit. He says, you're just given this false claim of this false God back to this false God. So give to him what's his, and then give to God what's God's. And what is the thing that bears the image and the inscription of God. Jesus is telling the people here, you can give this money to this other Caesar who's claiming all these things. It's not up to you as an individual person to change the whole system from the top down in one action. We can't do that. It's up to us to stand for the truth and follow the ways of God and do the job he gave us. And if we can do the job that he gave us and his perfect planning, he's got quite a bit of planning skills. He's got foresight. He's in the future already. He's not bound by time. So when he gives us a job and a plan, it's going to work out. We need to do it. And so when Jesus says, just give this thing that says Caesar is God to him, and let him come to his final destruction at some point. But what bears God's image and God's inscription? And that we know now with all of the rest of the New Testament and all of the rest of the teachings that we glean from the New Testament that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. We bear the stamp of God's name. We have the righteousness of Christ that we get given to us in our baptism, sealed by the Holy Spirit. We bear God's image from creation. It's a part of us. Even when the fall comes and and I was having some conversations with some folks. Even when the fall comes, it doesn't obliterate the image of God in us. It does bend it. It bends it quite a bit. But if you bend a bar, it doesn't make it not a bar anymore. It might not function the way it's supposed to. It might collapse and be weak and maybe even break. But it doesn't change what it is. But in God's redemption of that fall, We can take on the role that we were created for as image bearers of God, doing the things that he mandated us to do from the beginning. And we can do those things through God's power, through the Holy Spirit. With all the things that we've been given in our baptism, we now bear the inscription of God as well. Not only are we made in some kind of creational sense, but then the fall comes and just messes it up beyond repair. No. Jesus' work and where we find ourselves today as a part of this church, we can do those things that we were created to do. But, like he says with giving the coins back to Caesar, that doesn't mean that we ourselves are to make it so that the final consummation happens by our power. That's not part of the job description we have. 
sometimes we think, should I pay this thing back? Should I give this coin back to Caesar? In doing so, I must be somehow cheating on God's sovereignty or cheating on God's love for me or my love for him. God has us here at this time and place. And one of the jobs that Jesus has is coming back and this end event, eschaton, all these things that will happen in the eschaton, bringing about the final consummation, the full restoration, no more sin or death or crying or anything like that. It's not even a possibility anymore. But only Jesus can do that. So what we need to do is take very seriously the job we have been given, which is to hold to God's standard, to let that be our standard and our norm and our guide, and take it seriously, but also take just as seriously the fact that he calls us, the way a book that I've been reading says he calls us to come alongside in compassion for all the other people that we're in contact with as we limp together toward that norm, that high, holy calling. That kind of pastoral care, we can think of the priesthood of all believers, all of our Christian care for one another, means that sometimes we do have to do things that might seem like it's not quite right, but let's not put the pressure on ourselves of saying, if I do pay this tax to Caesar, am I just giving the world over to Satan. We can't do that. Satan's not the king of the universe. Christ is. And we already know the end of the ball game. We already know the score. We already know that God wins. Right? And we already know who's the one who makes that happen. That's freedom. That's freedom for us to just do the job we were given. That's freedom for us to stop feeling torn between the right thing to do in this situation. Just love your neighbor. Loving your neighbor can't become the standard to where we just let them burn their hand on the stove like we've said so many times before. It's not judging your neighbor to say, listen, that's going to hurt you. And I don't, I'm not the one coming up with that. God's coming up with that. God has a higher standard, a higher norm for us. But we can't use that higher norm to downplay the extent to which we're called to be in this messy world and be the hands and feet of Christ, loving our neighbors. Pay back to Caesar the things that bear his false inscription and his false divine claim. In doing so, you're not cheating on God. But then remember that you are the one. We as a church are the ones who are sealed by the Holy Spirit that bear the image of God from creation. And because of Christ and his work are getting closer to that final consummation of that image of God functioning the way it was supposed to again. Like the fall never happened. That's the image in Revelation is we have the city of God as if Adam and Eve had just done what they were supposed to and subdued the earth from a garden to a city. And we look at the world now and how messy it is and how difficult it is and how we have to try to become, you know, moral thinkers and ethical thinkers and what do we do in this situation? And all of those things, never mind the blatant evil that we see in the world, but the Bible's picture of that final consummation is like this whole fall never happened. We aren't the ones who can or are called to bring that. That's Christ's job. So what do we do in the meantime? What he tells us to. Love God. Keep in connection with God. Remember to to know his standard and truly what his standard is Because those standards and those rules that he's given us are just showing us his character. We have to know who he is. We have to not misunderstand who he is. But the second's like unto it. The second's the same as it. It's attached to it. 
Love your neighbor as yourself. Do the things that we're called to do. Be the hands and feet of Christ. It's okay to, to find yourself in a situation where you're not quite sure what to do. But Jesus ate with sinners, and he didn't, from what we can tell in any of these conversations that we see recorded here, say, oh, okay, now that you've eaten before you go, here's a couple stipulations that you have to do from here on out, or you have to come back and pay me back for this meal. Just meet people where they are and with your lives embody the call that we've been given. Another thing that we see as I'm studying for school and stuff is we're shifting in worldview. And with this shift in worldview, most of the people we're talking to, they don't care to sit down and hear a coherent argument and let the argument stand for itself. What they actually want is genuine people who genuinely love them, and then a genuine argument. And so what we have to do is show them what the right thing is to do. Show them who God is. We can't just sit them down and say, now listen, doesn't this make sense on paper? Therefore, you shouldn't do what you're doing. Or therefore, here is the way to help you out with what issues you have, or here is the way that you won't feel this anxiety anymore. That's not how it works in the world anymore. But that's not what we're called to do anyway. Jesus does say, go into the whole world, teaching them everything that I've taught you. But also, some of those things are, if you love me, keep my commands. And so, really, what this world is begging for in postmodernity is for us to do our job. The, for us to do our job that Jesus gave us, to embody, be the church in our actions, be the church in what we actually do, be there for people. To not answer their needs with a piece of paper and an argument but to be relationally there for them, to love them, to have a genuine relationship with them. Then, if it comes down to it, and they start to open up to what's making this happen it, within a relationship, then the answers that you are seeking to share with them on paper are going to come up. The truth of God's not going to be contained just because you're loving people. In fact, that's the only way it's going to spread. That's the job he's given us. If I try to sit down with my daughter and just start teaching her theory of things, she does not pay attention. She moves around a bunch. She comes up with other things. She adds her two cents. We don't get many places. But if we're out doing things together, if we're father and daughter and just living life as father and daughter, you'd be surprised the stuff that she asks about. You'd be surprised the stuff that she says, and I add to it, and then she adds to it. I'm like, that's good. I'm going to use that in one of my papers. It's just doing life. It's loving our neighbors. It's treating other people the way that they ought to be treated, given that they bear the image of God, whether they're in the kingdom of God or not, from creation. But what we are to do is to bring more and more people into this kingdom of God and have them sealed with the Holy Spirit as well. And the only way that that's going to happen with the culture that we have now is if we live it, not just argue it, not just write it. And that's the thing we're called to do. So I think that it's something that might look scary to us, but it's something that Jesus shows here. Sometimes we get into issues where it's a yes or no, and it's not actually that. We just need to reframe it. And I think that that's what we're seeing with the world today. It's not actually as scary as it looks. It's different. 
that makes it a little, you know, uneasy territory. But it's not actually scary, given that they're asking us for what Jesus has told us to do. They're making our job super easy. When we're not sure how to proceed with this constantly changing culture, let's do what we should have been doing the whole time. Just do what we're called to do. Follow that because they're begging for it. Let's do those things. Let's remember that Jesus' question about this coin is inferring now whose image and likeness and inscription do you bear? We know that answer. And we know that because of that answer, it changes everything for us. Things aren't nearly as complicated as they seem. And we shouldn't have ever thought of it that way. But even more so now. Love God. Love your neighbors as yourself. This is what the church is supposed to do. This is our job given us to, to us by this perfect planner. And then, knowing we can't do it on our own, driven, given the power by the Holy Spirit, driving us in doing this, let's just do our jobs the way he says to do them, because that's how we take these complex issues and make them simple enough for us to do it. We're really only having to do what we always should have been doing, what we're called to do. To me, that seems pretty simple. Amen.
Let us pray. Gracious Father, just a moment ago, Jana quit playing. And all of a sudden, your servant heard individual voices praising you in such a unique way. And what Jordan just said, be about your work makes it very individual and our voice is singing your praise in an individual way is a simple and beautiful expression to what we've been called to do. And so my prayer is that this week you would open up opportunities, moments, conversations, prayers where we can take that which has been placed in our hearts, in our baptism, and translate that into action so that someone knows that they're loved by God because we care. And I pray you would just give us so many opportunities. Gracious Father, I thank you for Oregon. I thank you, dear Lord, for people who are searching for ways to express their love for you. I thank you for a group of people committed to finding your will as they seek in time a permanent pastor. Meantime, I praise you for the privilege of simply living and being among you. Father, our world is filled with many things. Some of it is so bad. And we just pray that in the infusion and gift of the Holy Spirit, that hearts could turn from hatred to love. We pray for those who have to lead, and we pray for the political situation, that the rancor and the hatred that just seems to be so evident can be moved to feelings of care and expression that will do your will and build our nation. We pray for those who are going through special needs, those in our hearts that we name, now either on our lips or within our heart. We do this now. Fred Basin. Father, we ask that you would touch every life and every soul that has been in our heart. Where they are lonely, fill it with an expression of care. Where there is just illness and possible death, to surround them with comfort. Father, we offer all of these prayers in the precious name of Jesus, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before I pronounce the dismissal, those of you who have been thinking and praying about it, Rita, if you would meet them here, so that you can express your care through this trunk and treat experience. Now, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Thank you.